I had wanted to make a battery-powered Bluetooth speaker for a long time. My parents had some bookshelf speakers they had never used, and I had found a lot of videos out there of corded Bluetooth speakers or speakers you had to swap the power input and output if you wanted to charge the battery. But I wanted something different. This is a story about that. Once I dismantled the two speakers, leaving me with two woofers and two tweeters, I cut a piece of curly white oak that would become the front and back panels and started the milling process. Flattening one face and one edge at the jointer, then surfacing the opposite face at the planer, and finally cutting the last rough edge at the table saw. I wanted to make the front and back panels identical, so I resawed the piece right down the middle on my new Grizzly bandsaw. Now, curly white oak is a really dense hardwood, so I'm really excited about being able to make these kinds of cuts now. Once I had my two panels, I squared up the ends on my table saw with a sled. Then I laid out the front panel. Now, I needed to make two 3 and 5 eighths inch holes, but I don't have a hole saw or Forstner bit that big. I do have a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit though, so I converted 3 and 5 eighths into an improper fraction of 29 eighths to help me figure out what my starting hole size should be. Once I had my big fraction, I just subtracted 3 eighths until I got to a number of my biggest corresponding Forstner bit, which was an inch and 3 eighths. Does that make sense? Well, hopefully it will. I drilled the four holes that would eventually house the four speaker drivers and headed over to my router table. With the rabbiting bit installed, I started cutting a 3 8 inch rabbit about halfway through the depth of the panel, then I flipped the panel over and made another pass. What I failed to realize was that with each subsequent pass, I was actually removing 3 quarters of an inch at the bit since the bearing would ride on the previous rabbit. I should have stopped right here. But I did. It's okay though, I fixed it. Initially, once I had achieved the size hole I needed on the rabbit side of the panel, I would have used a flush trim bit to bring the smaller hole up to the size of the bigger rabbit. I'm sure there's a rabbit hole joke in there somewhere. Then I would have profiled the edge of the opening with a chamfer bit and had the woofer inset a little. Instead, I just widened the rabbit with a chisel until the faceplate of the speaker fit into the rabbit, bringing the front of the speaker more or less flush with the front of the panel. It actually looked really good. A happy accident. To make the box for the enclosure, I cut a piece of walnut that would be long enough to make my side pieces in a way that I could have grain continuity around the whole box. I flattened one side of the jointer, then took it to my planer. For some reason, there's always a problem with me and walnut. It's like my nemesis. Remember the kitchen stool video? Well, my planer was working fine the day before with the curly white oak, this time it didn't want to feed the stock through. I cleaned the feed rollers, but I think it's a feed roller pressure issue. And this was actually a Mother's Day gift, so I didn't have time to fool with machinery, so I opted to force it through until I had enough time to investigate. Ay ay ay. Then I continued to square up the stock at the jointer and the table saw. I was pretty tickled with my newfound resawing ability, so I took my walnut over to the bandsaw to split this piece in half so I could make a second speaker for myself later on. And hey, walnut's expensive, so two for one. 
Back at the table saw, I needed to cut some 45 degree bevels, but didn't want to make a new sled for my table saw. Instead, I opted to just cut a new kerf in my crosscut sled, thinking it would save time. Delighted by my time-saving decision, I forgot to check if there were any offending screws in the way of my saw blade. Good job, Will. This was my first time making a continuous grain box. The hardest part was keeping track of each piece and which way the bevel should go. Instead of cutting two long pieces, then cutting two short pieces, I had to cut the pieces sequentially. There's a lot of flipping back and forth. Once I had the pieces cut and stacked end to end, I realized this kiln dried walnut had released some tension when I resawed it and it cupped. Since the pieces were sequential, I hoped for the best and went on with glue up. I thought I'd try the old painter's tape clamp trick. I don't know if it was because my shop was dusty, the tape was old, my relationship with walnut, or the YouTube gods didn't want me to look cool, but this glue up went terribly. Once the glue dried, I took the tape off and traced the inside of the box onto the front and back panels. I wanted somewhat of a piston fit, so I took the panels over to my new Grizzly Combo Sander and sanded down to the lines that I just drew. With this kind of bevel or miter glue up, it's never a bad idea to reinforce the joint somehow. Plus, it adds a little pizzazz. A while back I made a spline jig to fit over my table saw fence, and since my table saw has a router table built in, I can use this jig with either my table saw or the router. It's pretty handy. For the spline material, I ripped down some white oak on my big bandsaw, then kept the fence locked just in case I needed to make more afterwards. I cut out little triangles at my Grizzly benchtop bandsaw, and for small pieces like this, I like to use a piece of scrap plywood as a zero clearance table, so the little pieces don't fall through after they're cut. I think I learned that trick from Jimmy Duresta. While the glue was drying on the splines, I put the box around the panels, but I used a thin piece of scrap to inset the panel just a little to give a small shadow line on the finished product. I glued some small pieces of scrap to my line all the way around the front of the box to act as a ledger for the front panel to glue to. And for the back, I had some thicker triangular cutoffs of walnut I glued into the corners that I'll be able to screw on the back panel in case I ever need to remove it. On to the hardware. I needed to drill part way through the front and back panels with a half inch four center bit, then all the way through with a quarter inch bit to accommodate the on off switch and the barrel jack for charging. I'll have a link in the description to all of the hardware I used, including the amp board and battery, which was the hardest thing for me to find affordably that was powerful enough to power the amp. Plus it helps the channel out a little bit if you follow this link and buy anything on Amazon. I desoldered the old leads and added new wire to all of the speakers, then hooked everything up for a proof of concept. The board specified that 8 ohm drivers at 12 volts was optimal, which is what I used, but with the amp gain dip switches set to the full 100 watt output, the board would cut out when the power was turned on. I'm not an audiophile and I'm not an expert on impedance, but my thought is by adding the tweeters it doubled the resistance, causing the board to cut out. 
Now, anybody with more expertise in this field, please feel free to chime in in the comments section. This channel is all about learning. Okay, my solution to the power supply. I found this 12 volt 6800 milliamp hour battery on both eBay and Amazon. They range in price from about 20 to 30 bucks, but they're small and lightweight. The battery has two plugs, an input for charging and an output for powering a device. I cut the output jack in the middle of the line and soldered on extensions to both leads. On the negative side, I soldered an inline switch between the power output and the amp board. On the input side, I cut off the stock female jack and added one that could be installed to the back panel. These barrel jacks have three terminals. One is the ground and is optional, but the other two have no markings indicating polarity, so I had to use some trial and error. In my first configuration, the charger started to heat up, so I unplugged it immediately. But this is the configuration that worked. With all the sound electronics together, it was time to start putting it all together. I trimmed the splines with my flush cut saw and scraped the curly white oak. Curly white oak is absolutely beautiful and using a card scraper really is the best way to get a decent surface finish. Just look at the luster on the left after scraping. After I glued the front panel on, I sanded the walnut enclosure up to 220 grit. Shellac was the only finish I had on hand at the time, so I tried my hand at French polishing. Shellac dries incredibly fast, so in my research I found that when applying it to anything with size, you should use the lift off and landing method. Imagine your pad is an airplane touching down then lifting back off. After the shellac had dried, I used a clean rag and my sander as a buffer. This works surprisingly well to bring out a nice sheen, and hats off to David Picciuto for mentioning this tip in one of his recent videos. I installed the speakers to the front panel, and since the panel where the mounting holes for the woofers was too thin for any screws, I held them in place with a scrap piece of wood screwed in the center. Then I installed the switch and barrel jack. I fixed the battery and amp board to the back panel using hot glue, which worked remarkably well. I tidied up the cords a little, then slipped the back panel in. Remember that piston fit I was looking for? Watch the dust expel from the corners as the panel slides into place. I pre-drilled and screwed the back panel on in case I need to fix any of the electronics in the future. Turned it on and hey, it worked. The American Persimmon, the Aspiros Virginiana. Some thoughts I have for the next one. This one sounds a little tinny, and that could be because this is a sealed enclosure, and I might experiment with putting a port on the back of the next one, or using some drivers with a little better frequency range. This was the second Bluetooth amp I've bought, and I don't love the delay in this one when turning it on. It's about 8 seconds where the one I have for my shop speakers turns on almost instantly. My mom was totally blown away this year and I think it turned out gorgeous. I love how it's a standalone satellite speaker that's rechargeable and completely cordless when in use. I'm definitely going to make one for myself and I hope you do too. Thanks for watching.